This is the DTV Digest, the podcast that brings you news and reviews of films which didn't make it to the cinema. And now, here's your host, Mike Parkin. Hello everyone and welcome to the DTV Digest, the podcast which brings you reviews of films which didn't make it to the cinema and instead went straight to DVD, Blu-ray or streaming media. I'm your host Mike Parkin and joining me for the top half of the show is Will Bentley. Hello. And later on you'll be hearing the dulcet tones of Richard Halls. Uh, So this week we're going to be kicking off with three films. We're going to be looking at Tokyo Dragon Chef. Then we're going to be moving on to Silence and Darkness, and then we're going to round off the reviews with Sate Hall. Our short shot this week is a film called Highway Violence, and our DTV throwback is going to be Ar- Ooh, Armageddon 2, no, Warlock 2, Armageddon. So without further ado, let's crack on. Okay, I'm joined by Will Bentley to talk about the film Tokyo Dragon Chef, uh, being released by Terracotta Distribution. Uh, our old friend, uh, Jerry Terracotta, um, who you met, probably remember, Will, uh, we met quite a while ago. Um, yeah. One of the film festivals that we, we attended back back in the old days before the the blight of COVID, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, so so they're still going strong. This and and this particular release, I think, um, should should go down very well. So what we have here is um, two uh, brothers, although I, I do believe they're brothers by different mothers, um, Tatsu and Ryu. Tatsu is just getting out of prison, and he's met by Ryu in a, a very decent pastiche of the film The Blues Brothers. In fact, a <laughs> lot. A lot of this film is is, is kind of um, built around the sort of um, the Blues Brothers um, sort of format. Um, so yeah, so Tatsu and Ryu are ex Yakuza. Um, the the old gangs have been destroyed. We'll get into that a bit later on. So uh, Ryu is now driving a um, a little um, sort of takeaway van selling uh, Nata de Coco, I believe. Um, which is kind Enjoy. of like a bubble tea kind of kind of kind of thing, um, and and he wants he, he and his brother to sort of open a Chinese restaurant and uh, start selling ramen noodles. Um, so so well this you know this film sort of like defies a lot of expectations I believe you know um, starting off with that sort of like uh, Blues Brothers pastiche, and then breaking out into song and dance, which is just like very bizarre it's really strange i mean it it, it you know it's really it doesn't just you know defy definition it, you know it's all it's, it's coming close to defying description it, it, it's just so mm. weird um yeah the blues brothers thing at the beginning was actually really you know that that, that kind of pastiche i'm coming out of jail and sort of everything's everything's mm. changed kind of thing um was just i just thought was really just really cutely done and it was a really good way to introduce both the, the two main characters, Tatsu and Ryu, and yeah. their kind of their their their, their personalities, um, and you know, just the, the kind of the, the the strange little half world that the film is set in. You know, mm. this kind of odd kind of suburban, you know, yakuza playground. It is, isn't it? Because because it, it's it's um, it's off the habit. beaten path, isn't it? You know, the, the the little restaurant is this sort of little corner sort of place. You know, in a very sort yeah. of nondescript street. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's away from the usual sort of hustle and bustle of things. Uh, e- even yeah. though they do, they do sort of pull in, you know, they end up pulling in quite a few customers. Um, sort of thanks to, uh, in part, a, a YouTuber. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Called it's called Nose. Say it comes in and you know, sort of he tries their wares and blogs about it, and all of a sudden people want to sort of come and uh, and try it, which is uh, quite quite amusing. Um, I just thought, yeah, I mean, I thought it was good that they, they I mean, that, that whole social media angle seems, you know, hmm. completely relevant and, and not, you know, not, not not forced at all. It was like, it was like, oh yeah, of course that they'd have, they would do that nowadays. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Everyone, everyone does that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah, perfectly, absolutely, perfectly normal. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, there was um, there's, there's a Korean series on YouTube we watched recently, which had a sort of similar sort of thing about setting up this restaurant. No, that was I can't remember what it was called now. 
That was really good. <laughs> that was a really, oh. really useless aside that was. <laughs> Without being able to back up any sort of facts or anything. I, know, I was going to say, or even name the film. Yeah, uh, it's such an it's such a good film. I can't remember the name. <laughs> oh boy, that's my memory for you. Um, yeah, but but yeah, there's you know so many sort of lovely little bits. That, that even when you know uh, tap. Um, Tatsu's getting out of prison, you know, and he's putting his old Yakuza clothes on, you know, the snazzy suit, the outlandish shirt and that. And there's this sound effect of like a gun cocking as he puts his sunglasses on, yeah, you know. <laughs> for, for, for no reason. <laughs> for no reason, but, you know, as he puts sunglasses on, you hear this <laughs> sort of thing, you know. It's, um, it's, it's quite funny. But then you see his brother outside wearing this sort of apron and little bow tie. You know, because he's he's, he's running. yeah in the most hilarious little takeaway van that he's yeah, got. That exactly. Just you know, because uh, that that whole conversation like, where's the Mercedes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah like... exactly. That's Blues Brothers again. You know, so yeah. what do you do with it? yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, and it's quite funny. The, the, there's a bit um, early on as well where um, uh, this this drunken couple come and start ordering a stupid number of bloody. Um, you know, co coconuts, basically, because you know they, they, these are like, as I said, you know, the like bubble tea kind of things. And this yeah. guy's going, yeah, I want ten, I want t ten of these. <laughs> and he's a, yeah, and you know, you, you and I have worked in the service industry. Yeah, you know, we, we, we're, we're veterans of Weatherspoons. We're not, we're not, you know, we've, yeah. and we, you know, we used to have this kebab shop next door, uh, and we're very aware of the sort of, you know, the our customers becoming their customers kind of thing in this yeah. sort of shit happening. Yeah, yeah, or 10, yeah, sort of like... Yeah, sort of yeah, yeah, you know exactly where the conversation... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know exactly where the conversation's going, and, it, and it's just, like, brilliant. Yeah, it's very <laughs> funny. But, yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's really good. Um, so, yeah, we've got these other outlandish characters uh, coming into it. As we mentioned, we've got sort of this YouTuber who, who has a few scenes. Um, this girl called Kokoro, who's a... Um, uh, seems to be a schoolgirl, but absolutely addicted to noodles, uh, to ramen noodles, and yeah, she, to quite an astonishing degree. Yeah. yeah, she even breaks out into song about it twice, I believe. Um, that was a surprise to me. It really did. It it was mm. a it became a musical, and mm. you know it was a it was a really weird musical as well. Because... It was, and and <laughs> you know the song the songs are pretty catchy, even though they're in sort of Japanese. And and the second one she sings, where, where, you know, when when um, there's this sort of fight breaking out, and she starts singing, and it is basically it's it's a version of Aretha Franklin's. Um, uh, respect song respect, from um, yeah. um, the Blues Brothers. You know, it's, it's, it's got the same, almost the same tune, but not. You know, but enough to sort of go, yeah, I can see where you, what you're doing there. Yeah, it's just really cool. Uh, so she gets some um, sort of interesting little scenes. Uh, across the road, we have two other uh, rivals who turn up. So, well, I say two, two other brothers, I should say, who who turn up. Um, they're also ex yakuza aren't they? Exactly, and have, they almost have this sort of identical conversation, you know, because because um, Ria and Tatsu have this conversation in the um, in the bathhouse at the beginning, where he's sort of saying, "I think we should open a Chinese restaurant and sell <laughs> ramen noodles." <Yeah. laughs> and then then you have these two other guys who are probably about twenty years older than they are, you know, having the same yeah. conversation. <laughs> Can, yeah, yeah, I think, exactly I think we should, I think yeah. we should have a, sort of ditch the yakuza and. Open, open a restaurant. Um, They're down on the look for exactly the same reason as uh, Tatsu and Rio, though. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's this guy called Gazumo, who um, we we see a sort of flashback of when he was sort of younger, and um, you know, he's, he's been put upon by some yakuza thugs, and he decides to form his own gang to take out all the yakuza. And, and while, while Tatsu's been away in prison, that's exactly what he's been doing. And, and taking over the neighbourhoods and things like this, uh, with this sort of very outlandish costume. He, he's, he's carved this like third eye into his forehead, and then um, all his followers wear these sort of giant eyeball masks, which um, is actually quite reminiscent of a, another uh, Japanese series called 20th Century Boys. Um, oh, that, I didn't. I, I missed that reference, but I was trying to work out. I was certain that. Some, I'd seen something similar. Yeah, I, I know. You, yeah, because I think you, you did see those ones because yeah, that was like a two-parter or a three-parter. I can't remember now. Um, oh, that was quite a few years ago, but it was very good. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so, so that was sort of a reference to that kind of. Um, but he's, he's this whiny little shit, basically. 
Yeah, he's just, I, he's... I think he's he's the, probably the weakest link in the film. Is is that he's you know, um, despite his actions, he, he doesn't seem that much of a threat to these guys, really. Physically, no, he's not. But he's mm. just he's just really manipulative, and he's managed yeah. to, you know, he's managed to get where he is by just being by being this sneaky little sod, basically. <laughs> that's that's mm. what he's done. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So. Um, Another character we need to mention that turns up is this uh, girl called uh, Mimi, who helps out the Ozawa brothers, the, the sort of the rivals across the street. Um, they, they, they've gone a sort of different route with their food, whereas um, uh, sort of Tatsu, as the chef, is trying these sort of innovative ways of sort of cooking up ramen noodles, you know, inspired by his days in prison, basically. Um, he won the awards. He won the, yeah. he won the, the championships while in prison. That's it. So um, the the other two across the street, um, who are uh, Kazu and Zin, um, Ozawa brothers, um, they, they've gone for sort of just big flavors. Basically, it's like it doesn't matter how shit the food is, as long as it's you know plentiful and sort of meaty kind of, kind of thing. <laughs> so it's just you know whereas uh, Tatsu's plates you know are relatively sort of artistic you know so wouldn't look out of place on sort of like master chef japan sort of thing you know these guys are just like this huge mound of noodles and, and slabs of pork yeah. <laughs> yeah. but because mimi comes along and um is a another youtuber who um is sort of famous for being able to pack away huge amounts of food you know um she be she helps them become an overnight sensation as well, but sort of just eating these stupid amounts, <laughs> piles and piles of bloody, you know, sort of noodles and, and slabs of meat. So it's just quite amusing, but but it works. It does. It, um, it, I mean, is it like the, the, the interest in the food and actually, you know, the food being important and like little kind of tropes and sketches on the food mm. is a big feature I've I've noticed in like, sort of when when Asian cinema does a kind of food themed thing you know and, and you, you sort of like you don't need to be an expert or whatever it's just it's like it these are like homages to the food yeah you know, and to the place that food has in society and stuff and you know like a lot of there's there's clearly a lot of pride in you know the food that they're talking about and how it's mm. done and it kind this... of reminds me I mean it's right the first first thing like this that I saw was that Chinese feast years ago yeah yeah um, um, but you, I think, I think you, I don't know if you like that. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I've got that. Tucked you know, but it does. It's, mm. This is, I mean, this is like a comedy, a comedy gangster action, mm. um, you know, thriller about noodle battling noodle <laughs> restaurants. And but they're actually, they're actually really bothered about, you know, about the place that food has in it. Yeah, there's there's two scenes in particular that sort of stand out with that. There's, um. If you remember back in the Blues Brothers, is the moment when um, oh, yeah. Jim, Jim uh, John Belushi um, gets hit by the sort of you know the light from God sort of thing and goes, "We've got to yeah. put the band back together," you know, <laughs> and, and uh, it's sort of a similar moment with Tatsu, but it, it, it's when he he tastes he tastes the 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 no no not the tattoo. I mean that is the bit oh, that, yeah. that you think yeah. is going to be, but it's actually a bit later on when the girl delivering the the noodles sort of feeds it to him when he tastes it, and you get this sort of like sort of grainy sort of soft focus scene sort of back to his childhood of his mum sort of like feeding him noodles you know yeah. it's, it's like, oh my god it's like what my mum you know used to make me and then later on the other chef Zin um he has a similar bit where he goes you know I don't want to be you know really I don't, I don't want to be sort of doing this sort of piles of piles of food I want to do something <laughs> a bit more sort of delicate and he tells this story about him going to this place and meeting this old woman who you know, she runs this shop, but she can only serve four customers at a time because, you know, she puts so much effort into the food and that sort of thing. And, and it's, it's a really sort of touching story, you know, and it's sort of so, so nicely told when he, when he, when he does it. And so, you know, and he's making these noodles for Mimi at the same time. So, yeah, it, it, as you say, it, um, it does sort of pay homage to the, um, yeah, the, uh, the, the humble noodle. The food itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The food yeah, itself is yeah. important. Mm-hmm. absolutely so yeah a lot of fun this um you know and and it sort of goes a bit more sort of traditional sort of good guys versus bad guys towards the end when uh sort of one of the characters gets kidnapped and they have to sort of uh sort of come to a rescue so yeah a lot going on 
it's it's an interesting film because you know I was watching it. I'm thinking this this would be a good sort of entry point for anyone wanting to sort of watch a bit of sort of strange Japanese sort of filmmaking because it's yeah, I mean, not, it's, it's not too quite, over it's the quite top. indie it's quite yeah. indie flick isn't it I mean it's it, it's a small you know it's like a it's not a massive blockbuster but it's it is like a really good like you say intro into the, their way of telling stories and the kind of things yeah that, it's it's very you know. quirky it, it, it's very you know it's very hip very very fun it's not you know it's not gory or anything i mean this is from um excuse me a minute uh, this is from director uh yoshihiro nishimura who did films like um tokyo gore police and dead sushi and uh, Meatball Machine, so you can sort of kind of tell from those titles. You know, he, he does the sort of big gore effects, basically, in a lot of his films. But this is, you know, it's a, a different tack altogether. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's fun. It's a musical, uh, which which is weird. But it, it's got that sort of gangster element to it, but that doesn't sort of play out the way you expect. So, yeah, this this is, a, you know, it's, it's it's a lot of fun and and, and very different to what you, um, you might be expecting or... or or not <laughs> well I, I i i to be honest with you i've put my expectations aside every time you send me something to watch mm -hmm. that's probably a good way to do it yeah um and, and yeah it's, it's probably worth not watching the trailer as well i mean one of the things in this um yeah I, 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 I usually rally against this this thing that happens where you get these intro cards come in for the characters. You know, they introduce a character and their name is splashed across the screen. Mm. Um, uh, for, uh, there's a film we, we reviewed recently called Knuckle Dust, which did that. And I'm thinking, it's you know, it's 2020. When, when, <laughs> why are we still seeing this? You know, it, it's not bloody Quentin Tarantino doing Reservoir Dogs back in 1995 or wherever it was. You know, mm. we, we, we're, we're we're past that, surely, you know. Um, but no, apparently we're not, you know. But but with this one, I was like, I, I'll I'll go with it, you know. I'll, I'll allow it on this occasion. It, it didn't bother me as much because it sort of, it fit in with the rest of the film, you know. It fit in with this sort of style that they were, they were presenting. Yeah, I mean, it, it it sort of it was a bit eclectic, to be honest with you. I mean, mm. they they kept, um, you know, they they had they had lots of different. I mean. For the most part, it just it was fairly kind of you know straightforwardly shot, but they, but you know when they just do certain scenes and they would really kind of go for it with a different you know a, a different kind of genre effect, mm. you know a different sort of you know, and they would they, they were clearly just having fun. I mean, you know, this film, yes, it had the big banner kind of you know full screen splash titles at the start. It had a, but it it had musical, <laughs> you know, all the yeah. bits all the bits with the with Kizumo like and his and his eyeball head gangsters was very it was really sci-fi yeah in a way and in fact i was thinking actually the thing that it made me think of was um kubrick's uh clockwork orange all right yeah 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 you know, yeah with the jumpsuits yeah 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 but not just that just the way that they, there was this, this, the kidnap scenes hmm. you know were were like the, that those kind of long shot vignettes that he did and um <clears throat> sorry there was, you know, there, there was, there was like a, there was loads of different. It, so you, I think you can sort of forgive them for the, for the, for, for kind of like the big hmm. <coughs> um, banner titles on the screen. Um, yeah, especially because it was just because it was like because they were doing loads of mad stuff. Yeah, because <laughs> because they revisited later on, you know, just before they do the sort of you know attempt the rescue kind of thing, and they reintroduce all of the characters who are on the rescue with their weapons, you know, like like yeah. it was a, like it was a sort of Shaw Brothers um, kung fu movie, you know. or a video game. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Video, it's just yeah. like to me, to me, it was just like yeah, this that that's like the that's the title sequence to a to a, like a nineties beat 'em up. Yeah, sort of, yeah, sort of like side scrolling, sort of yeah, shooter, yeah, like a Tekken or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Double Dragon. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, even better. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, we we can't recommend this enough. Basically, it, it's um, it, it's a lot of fun. The, the music's catchy. Um, just just go with it, basically, um, and have fun with it, and and you'll find yourself hankering for some pot noodles afterwards. I think. Definitely.
So what are we going to score it, uh, Will? Oh, nearly called you Rich then. <laughs> um, I, I like you say. I mean, I can't. I can't recommend this highly enough. It kept me entertained. It was. It was funny, quirky, entertaining, and you know had substance to it. You know, I think we're we're quite stingy here on DTV, though. Um, mm -hmm. You know, on the DTV Digest, we don't. I don't I've never heard of a ten. Um, no, you know, we'll we, we haven't. Say, we've like, never gone that high. Um, no, and I don't. I think. I think really, we we got to. You, you know. It's like I'm looking for reasons not to give it a, a nine, really, and mm. I'm I'm not really finding any. There isn't anything, there isn't anything bad about it. I mean, you know, they everyone clearly was in, was was loving making this film, mm -hmm. and and it came it came over as just great fun, great entertainment, a good story, weirdly told, or a weird story, well told. I don't yeah, know. I'm absolutely. not sure which one it is. Yeah. Which one it is. And I, I'm sort of thinking, I'd be I would be I'd be mean not to give it a nine. I can't mm -hmm. think of reasons why not to give it a nine, right. apart from we are just not that generous. <laughs> Fine, yeah, f okay, um, a, a nine from Will, and I'm I am going to be a little bit stingy. I'm going to go with an eight, and I'm knocking a point off mainly as as we talked about uh, the villain Kazuma um, being a bit being a bit of whiny shit, basically. But mm. um, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but you know, a very strong eight and a nine for um, Tokyo Dragon Chef. I will just also say that the um, the credit sequence uh, contains a preview for a proposed episode two. Now I'm I'm just on IMDb at the moment. I, I just want to sort of double check something to see if it's um, if this is a you know an actual a threat, you know, or a promise mm. of, of something coming up. Um, There's not a lot on IMDb for this. I think they must no. have received the, uh, the the information for this I, on Friday afternoon. I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit annoyed with IMDb uh, for this because they've made no effort to um, sort of put the characters' names in. Uh, for, nothing, for this There's nothing on it. At all. Um, so Yoshihiro no, himself isn't, isn't um, doesn't seem to be involved in a sequel so it might just be a um a, a you know a weird joke sort of put in at the end um or or it might be a promise who knows it, it'd be interesting to see definitely if they um, if they go down that route but I'll check it yeah, out yeah i'd check it out uh, yeah there, there, there's um i think there's another little bit right at the end sort of typical sort of marvel kind of uh, post credit thing going on there but um definitely worth checking out so this gets an eight and a nine from the DTV Digest for me and Will. Uh, so go check it out. Our next review is Silence and Darkness. Uh, sisters Anna and Beth, one blind and the other is deaf, live happily in a secu secluded small town with their father. However, when a neighbor stops by, Anna and Beth began to realize that their father's intentions may be more sinister than they could have imagined. Um, so this is the first feature by a director called Barak Barkin. Um, he's done a few shorts before. Um, I had a quick look at them. They're quite quite fun, you know, sort of satirical kind of things about people's relationships. Uh, this this is a very big um, sort of turn for him uh, in, into sort of bigger territory. Uh, it is very slow paced. Uh, it's it's full of very long takes with not much happening. Uh, but at the same time, I found this quite engrossing. Uh, the characters especially sort of draw you in. Um, so Anna and Beth, as we said, uh, one is blind and the other is deaf. Um, they sort of live a sort of almost sort of symbiotic um, sort of relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they do sort of rely on each other, but at the same time, are reasonably sort of independent and, and they do have this sort of rather idyllic sort of lifestyle uh, sort of living out in this sort of, you know, this vast sort of countryside. And on, on the surface, we, we you know, when, when we meet their father, who's the local doctor, you know, he also seems to be, you know, quite um, benevolent and obviously doting on his daughters and they certainly dote on him. But it's not long well before that facade slips. No, um, I mean, I mean, it, and it, it kind of, did, I'm not sure. It's the first, the first clue that visit he has from his um, one friend, of his patients, yeah, one of Mrs. his patients, Mrs. Long, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Long, kind of clues you in that that dad has got some issues, mm. um, you know, because that that 
that whole completely inappropriate doctor's visit, um, you know, tells tells you straight away that he's he's not great, he's unethical, and also he's really, you know, he's really he's just really weird. There's something really off kilter about him. Um, and then, obviously, when he was re- when he re- when he returns to the girls, you know, at the end of his working day, um, even even before, you know, the the, the scene where he um, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but it's hard to talk mm. about this film without saying. Yeah, stuff. I think I think we're gonna have to talk a little bit around what what what, what, what what's going on. Otherwise, <laughs> this would be the most vaguest review ever because because there's not a lot of content really. No, no um, it's just spread, it's spread out over a long it's spread out over yeah. a long time. Mm. Um, but you know, I mean, he's it's like you say the girls the girls do have like a really they do have a symbiotic relationship because you know one hears for the other and the other one sees for the other mm. and. You know, when when they when you see them working together to cook his birthday dinner, it's one of the first one of the first scenes. They're really happy and excited to be doing it, and you see how they sort of share the share the tasks, and it's like very seamless. And then the way they sort of communicate, because obviously, uh, is it Beth who's deaf? Um, I think it's similar. I think I think Beth is the blind one. Blind girl. Right? Uh, and Anna's 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 deaf. So obviously, yeah. Um, you know, uh, um. Uh, we've got it right. Beth, Beth can't. Anna can't see. Yeah, so they can't use normal sign language. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that they communicate is that it sort of put me in mind of that Helen Keller movie. You know, they they do a mm. sign language where they they talk with their hands. Yeah. Um, you know, they they talk um, like you doing doing a sign a contact sign language, mm. which is in, quite in, quite fascinating to watch. Um, you know, and how they sort of find each other when they're you know, when they're in, in the same room and how they sort of, you know, like you can kind of tell that, I mean, you know, I'm going to get this wrong, aren't I? So Anna can't, Anna can't um, hear, but she can mm. feel. Yes. Beth, Beth can't see, but she can hear. That's correct. So, you yeah. know, and and, it, and it's because it, I, mean, I was watching it at first and I was wondering, I was trying to work out if both of them were, were, were deaf and blind mm. because I didn't actually read any, I didn't read any blurb before I started watching it. And then you sort of then it, then it kind of clicks because you know um, uh, Beth is obsessed with music and she can mm. sing and play, um, you know. And then there's that, that incredible scene where she's teaching her sister how to play guitar. Yeah, yeah. Blind girl teaching a deaf girl how to play, and it's just it's just incredible. It's just very very clever mm. um, how that that. And it's when you sort of after you kind of see you see the happy family at the table when everything's great at the birthday party, and then he sing and he sings for them. But then after you realise that actually he's really wrong, he's he's just really wrong in, in mm. the obvious way that you see at work. But then when he comes home, you start to realise that his relationship with the girls is just it's wrong in a in a in a way that kind of slowly becomes more apparent. Um, it, yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the actor um, Jordan Lage play, plays the father, yeah. and um, he's, brilliant. he's he's very good because. He, he he's wearing sort of two masks basically. So so mm. there's the there's the doting father, you know, mm. sort of the mask he wears for the daughters and and for the community at large, mm. you know, so, um, mm. sort of p- upstanding pillar of community and all the rest mm. of it. And hasn't he got uh, it so hard looking after two girls who are you know mm. have such such uh, obstacles in their lives? But uh, but beneath that we find out that he is conducting this sort of weird. Um, Psych- psychopathic experiment mm. on his mm. daughters, and we we get a glimpse of it through these um, these these tape recordings that he's making. Mm. We sort of hear him mm. sort of talking about sort of the the relationship between the two daughters, and and um, mm. you know whether or not it's uh, you know he's he's musing out loud a lot whether or not he can sort of drive a wedge between them and sort of see how they yeah. cope and all this sort of stuff. And it's like it talks, oh, yeah. That, when you when you realise he's talking about them like the guinea pigs, you know, yeah. you immediately it just that the film just takes on an like an immediate mm. sort of shift. He we get his exposition through those tapes, and mm. we learn very quickly what's going on in his um, like basically the thing that makes him such a, a deeply menacing character because he is menacing he's a, oh, yeah. he's a menacing figure um and he goes from being that the, the good doctor with the you know caring so hard for his daughters and so on bringing them up on on their own on his own because the, the wife's not there mm. and he goes from that to being this really menacing 
you know, God, how do we define him? Kind of, kind of person. But the, yeah. the girls, it the the film is slow because all of those kind of lengthy shots of mm. the girls doing stuff is because it takes that long to 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 really get us into their into their viewpoint. Yeah, like because we it, you you can't you know, they can't communicate. Qu- it would be really trite and crass to try and have them explain how it feels to be them, and it also wouldn't work. So like I think mm. it did. I sort of realised that you you have to it, take that time to build up. Yeah. How do they experience the world? I mean, one of my, one of my my two favourite scenes in the film are, you know, the one we just talked about earlier, was where Beth's teaching Anna how to play the guitar, mm. which I thought was superb. And yeah. the other bit is um, Beth gets up in the middle of the night and hears a sound outside, yeah. and mm. then the next day she gets Anna to sort of go out and and she's mm. sort of giving her directions. So, so okay, you make mm. a digging sound over there. And it's like, no, it's not quite there. Go further back, you know. Mm. But but yeah. it's all done through sign language, and and, and you know, it's absolutely brilliant. From a, from a, it's fantastic from a distance, isn't it? Because yeah. um, it's all in know, all like... in one shot. Well, it, t- it, t- it takes two shots basically, but mm. you know, um, both characters are in shot all the time. You know, mm. Even though it's sort of distance. Yeah. Very very that that scene was brilliant. I thought that scene was extremely yeah. like cleverly done. Um, it, I don't yeah. want to talk about the end, but I kind of do because the the oh. the, the end the end the, the the well not the end but the mm. kind of the sort of the ultimate scene you know the scene where it's where mm. where it all comes to a where you know all comes to a head yeah is the first time when they like the director and cinematographer actually put you in their literally behind, behind their eyes yeah in, behind in their, their eyes in yeah, in their heads yeah, while yeah. while this while this very dramatic scene is playing out and by the time I th- you know. It was a it was a long film, but to get to that that point at the end, it was worth it mm. because that really that to me that was fantastic. That, yeah. Because that that was it couldn't be any other way. You couldn't you couldn't no. not show it through their from their points of view. Yeah, but the, the I mean just to go back as well, um, talking about the, the father, you know, um, you know I mentioned, mentioned this, he's he's wearing sort of two masks because he, he you mm. know he, he he sees himself I guess, I guess as this sort of dispas- dispassionate individual who as you say you know he's looking upon his two daughters as these sort of guinea pigs basically mm. but I, I i think he's to a certain degree he's fooling himself you know he's, he's fooling everyone else with his upstanding character and everything but he's also fooling himself into thinking oh no no this is this is all just an experiment i'm just here you know I, mm. i'm i'm um you know doing this totally detached from my emotions and stuff but but it's very apparent he becomes very jealous Oh, yeah. Of the of the two, um, yeah. his, his reaction. He got, the, the girls enter this um, talent competition, which is why Beth teaches Anna how to play guitar, so they can do this Bob Dylan number at this talent competition. Mm. And afterwards, yeah. when he's doing, doing his his um, his little tape recordings to himself, he's sort of talking about it, sort of going, "Well, that was a bit lackluster. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a bit rubbish. I'm sure everyone else thought it was rubbish as well. You know, and I'm thinking, yeah, you're absolutely jealous of of." Of what you know, how what how capable they are and what they're able to yeah. achieve despite yeah. their their thing, and then he he goes to an, a hell of an extreme measure. Oh, we won't go into what it is, but I was oh. so fucking shocked. Yeah, you know? I mean the yeah, the earlier stuff, this earlier stuff, which is creepy as fuck. Like like you know, um, where he sedates them so yes. that so that they are wholly dependent on him. You know, that's what it was all. That's what it's yeah. all about, isn't it? Is that he can't bear. Yeah, he can't bear not, their independence, and you know, yeah. and he wants to sort of keep them in that sort of regress state, and yeah. um, it, which was fucking creepy in itself, because mm. you, you know, he, he just if it wasn't for uh, Mrs. Bishop knocking on the door, he, you know, I'm thinking, yeah. where, where is this where going? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But anyway, I mean, he went. I mean, he went like you say, that was an extreme measure. He took an extreme measure to try to try and, hmm. like you say, drive a wedge to try and keep them keep them dependent. Um, and it won't, I mean, obviously, because we're not going, we can't go into detail about that mm. because it is a crucial, it's a it's crux cr- yeah. moment in the film. <laughs> but, you know, what, how they sort of develop from that is actually quite a satisfying mm. moment as well. There's moments after that where you think, ah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, even before things, even before things reach their ultimately dramatic conclusion, there's a scene where you're thinking, 
actually I think it would take him he, he, would, he would have to try a lot harder than that even as, as horrific as it is this that, that that surprised me this is this film when it starts off you really just think bloody hell am I going to be able to make it I'll be, I'll be mm. honest yeah you. I, I mean, was the it, same yeah you know it was it's beautifully shot if it's I think I read that it was shot in Vermont mm. um, which is an absolutely stunning part of the the world and the, the American sort of uh, it was in New England isn't it the eastern yeah um, eastern mm-hmm. side of, of, of the US and it's fantastic but it's it's lonely and it's quiet um and it's very still mm. um and the the there's an awful lot of um static shots in this um in in the, in the build up of this film of like vignettes of you know of just sort of still shots of people not doing very much and you you i think you have to put in a little bit of of effort before yeah. it starts giving back to you because it is just so still quiet and slow if if the, and, if the two if the two girls weren't so likable this would be a hard slog you know but the oh, fact gotcha. but, but the fact that you know um they they are that you know the, the characters are so engaging and mm. um i think they're ones to watch i'll actually i mean yeah. I'll, I'll say it because yeah. they're acting i didn't actually check yet to see whether they were you know, it you know because I remember yeah. watching watching the Quiet Place and the girl who played um, the the main the, the daughter and that the, mm. the girl the de- she was actually she's deaf in real life she's a deaf she's right. a deaf actor. I I, um, I didn't see any comments in in their IMDb pages to suggest they are either blind or deaf. But um, they're acting they're acting yeah. to suggest it is is very good superlative. Yeah. yeah, they're they're definitely. I mean, I need to find their names actually. I yeah, go, um, I didn't prep it's, myself. It's, it's Joan Jacklin. So Joan Glackin plays Anna, and Mina Walker plays Beth. And I may have got them mixed up <laughs> as to who's oh. the blind one, and who's the deaf one. But um, yeah, but the girl playing the deaf one. I mean, she, you know, she she she's really into Bob Dylan and this sort of stuff. And 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 there's sort of moments when she's sort of just rocking out, and it's like. Mm. She just looks so cool. What she's doing, yeah. you know, and she's wearing her sunglasses. I'm thinking, yeah, you're not wearing sunglasses because you're blind. You're wearing sunglasses because you know you look cool. Exactly <laughs> because you want to. It's because you want to be like because you want to be like Bob Dylan, basically. Yeah. You, you know, that, that, that's, well, that's really cool. Yeah, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting I, 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 that, the fact that she can sort of get on with her music and stuff, stuff, and not bother her sister at all. You know, it, it's it's never going to be a point where it's like you're annoying me with your music all the time. So. Yeah, I can't hear it. <laughs> you know, I can just get on and do what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, and the, the, that, that's the thing because you're sort of you, you're watching this with this with a certain amount of filmic language background mm. of if a person you know that you're watching on screen is deaf and surrounded by music, or if they're blind and surrounded by the, you know by by visual by visual things, by the beauty mm. of the landscape, or you know their family's faces, or or what's going on? You're you're what you know you're, you're you're watching it. Basically, you're almost waiting for the moment where that character is frustrated at what they haven't haven't got. Yeah. You know, or is or is it somehow at a disadvantage because of what they haven't got? You do not ever get that with these these characters. No. They are complete. They are complete largely because of the other person. Yeah. Um. But even you know even as as you know as individuals, um. They they are complete because that's that's their whole experience and they've lived around it for their whole their whole lives and in, in actual fact like yeah being able to share your sister's your love of music with your sister who can't hear it so mm. effectively yeah. um you know it's, it's just to me uh, you know just in in the, in the sense of looking at their in what do they, because they refer to them as impairments he refers to them as impairments mm. in that they the girls don't feel that they're impaired at all no, <laughs> One that's bit, right. they're just living within their experience and and like you know they're complete with the, with their impairment. So yeah, is um just I mean is, not without actually sort of revealing what it is again and sort of just going back to the ending um because we 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 get sort of this this climactic thing that happens and you may you know when it happens you may still be on the fence as to whether our perception of what's happened is correct. Or if we, or if we're just sort of reading into, uh, you know, re- reading sort of malevolent t- intentions into it, but then there's the scene at the end 
um, in in the car with a play the last tape or yeah. play the, the first uh, tape, the, the first, first tape. One, one, one of the early tapes, and it just brings it all home to you know mm. the actual horror of mm. what what this guy has done, and it's it, it mm. is devastating basically. Fuck me, yeah, it's, 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 it's because it's a, it's a, like a weird time delay thing because he just mm. reframes it and you just realise really just what he what he was like at you mm. know at heart. Yeah, um, exactly. And I mean, the, the the there is also like because you might be doubtful about the the sound in the woods. I mean, I think you're deliberately supposed to be doubtful about the sound mm. in the woods, you know, for a long time, um, you know. And the the girl's best efforts to to try and identify what what was happening, you know, what what he was doing in the woods yeah. don't and, actually and, come and to that, fruition. Exactly, and that, that's 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 interesting in itself, isn't it? Because a lot of films would have gone, would have, you know. Allowed them oh, to discover something, yeah, have, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but it never goes there, you know. It's, it's like, well, yeah, there's something going on, but or, yeah, or maybe there and they, you know, they they try really hard, and you and you're kind of on the on the edge of your seat, thinking, you know, and if it's there, if if there's if the thing's there to be found, they'll 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 find it because they're, mm. they're they're ingenious, like you mentioned that ingenious scene where they're looking, mm. looking for it. Um, it's just actually quite fun talking about this film in this way because you really don't, I really don't. I would I would recommend that if if you're not aware of any of this film, you don't know what what is happening in it. Don't mm. find out before you watch it because it's well worth yeah things that work when with with you not having any knowledge whatsoever of of what's coming up. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So uh, we're, we're going to score this. Will how how are you going to score this out of ten? I, I think as as a as a technical and acting. Like example, this this needs at least an eight. I think that yeah. you know, for the for the two girls' performance, they were that you know, what were their names again? I, I, I want to name them. <laughs> no, I do because yeah, you know, it's uh, Joan Newton. Joan Blackin and Mina Walker are the two. Yeah, two girls. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what's his name again? Uh, L- Larkin. J- J- Jordan Lage is Jordan Lage. Yeah. Jordan Lage, like the fa- fantastic, brilliant script, technical brilliant script because you've got one person in it who can't. Mm actually deliver vo- verbal lines mm. but manages to be a presence on stage yeah it's got to be at least an eight just, just for I, the performance i totally agree um it's this this film is going to try some people's patience you know if you if you're sort of more inclined to sort of you know sort of a quicker pace then you probably may want to avoid this but you know if, mm. if you if you can allow the film to just wash over you and and get to know the characters um and, and I think by the time you find out exactly what father is actually like, um, then, then you, you will be sort of hooked into this. Mm. Uh, so that's two eights for Silence and Darkness. Our next review is Sator. Uh, now, I'm just going to read out what the blurb is on IMDb, and then we'll discuss that. So this is how IMDb IMDb describes this film. Uh, Secluded in a desolate forest, a broken family is observed by Sator, a supernatural entity who is attempting to claim them. Now, Will, does that sentence resonate with you with anything you've just watched? No. (laughs) Not at all. So this is what I, I shall try and describe what I watched. So we've got this character called Adam, who uh, we meet deep in this forest. Um, we're not entirely sure why he's there to begin with, but he's he's got a few sort of motion sensor cameras set up uh, around and about, and he's got this very weird sort of um, whistle that's been sort of whittled out of a piece of wood that he keeps blowing um, as well. Mm. And for the first 12 minutes of this film, it is literally just him and his dog walking around the forest or sitting at his laptop trying to look at pictures of um, stuff that he's recorded and that is it for yeah. for at least 12 15 minutes of the film and then all of a sudden this other guy just appears in his cabin yeah just walks um, in it just it just turns up and it turns out that this is actually his brother uh, called Pete who had been in a mental hospital, we find out at the end of the film, um, mm. for, for a while, um, and had come up to sort of visit him. And yeah, this, 
it is very difficult to sort of uh, work out what the timeline for this film is. It's very non-linear. It keeps jumping mm. about um, sort of various things going on. Um, throughout the film, there is this narration, which I thought was from his grandmother, but it turns out to be from his mother who disappeared. Um, so we get this in this um, very sort of creepy, very atmospheric, it has to be said, um, sort of diatribe, um, mm. which is sort of this sort of narration. And presume, supposedly his, his grandmother was like channeling spirits and doing like spirit writing, I think it's called. Uh, mm, where, where, yeah, yeah, automatic writing. Oh, so automatic writing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, she'd written reams and reams of this stuff. And then her mother um, sort of put it down onto tape. Mm. Um, and that's kind of it. Really, yeah. <laughs> story-wise, yeah. it's it's you know this guy trying to make contact with this Sator thing, or you know trying trying to stop them, stop him from getting involved in his family. In which case, I'd say stay away from the fucking forest. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand why he's there. I like, honestly, yeah, this is Sator's st- stump, stomping ground, and you go there uh, and and keep blowing this whistle, trying to, you know, get him to appear. And then, I mean, brilliantly, he does appear, or something appears in the cabin, and which is a brilliant cut, where he's, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. he, he's he's you know he, he suddenly turns around, and then suddenly this this thing is sat in you know in, in the chair behind him. Which was absolutely brilliantly done. At which point it's time to go. Yeah. Seriously, you know. You think you'd, you'd think it'd be time to go by that point, but no. Um, there's, there's some other little bits going on. Um, the thing with the the, the the thing I really liked, uh, and something I always do like, is, is when technology reveals something. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. The and there's a bit with this photo that that is taken by by the the. Um, motion sensor camera and when he first looks at it it's like well he's just taking a photograph of the trees you know yeah. in, dark, in darkness but then he has he he sort of shoot, shoots the brightness up to, to maximum and then you can see see these figures hidden but hidden between the trees and i thought yeah that's, i love i love shit like yeah that's that quite that's, <laughs> that is quite cool and the, the, i mean the figures the figures themselves i mean again they're not mm. don't want to don't want to um sort of give away and, and spoil them, but the, the figures are really quite. They are they are very very it's, well. It's done. really good, yeah. And and funny enough, um, before re- recording this, I was I was watching the um, the new version of uh, Wrong Turn. There's, there's a sort of revamp of Wrong Turn, <laughs> and um, they've got a very similar design of you know using like um, I don't know, I suppose like elk skulls yeah, as, yeah. As, uh, as sort of masks and stuff like that mm. it, it's it's really effective i think it's very i mean because the, the stuff i read on imdb about this was saying it was like a trying to be a, a folklore mm. tradition and like that character it's almost you know that's almost like you go back to celtic imagery of of you know the sort of the kind of animist things and the things mm. in the forest you know or even the paintings from the the cave of cave of beasts in um uh, you know, like the, the sort of cave painting, oh, yeah, 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 stuff, and and, and it's and it's it, it, I mean, it's I suppose that's quite a kind of obvious thing for a uh, you know, a supernatural thing set in the woods, hmm. but it's just it's just done well, and you can tell that it's it's been done. This, this been this film's been made with not a lot of money, hmm. and they've done a great they've done they've done really well actually, considering that. You know what I mean, it's, it's what, what it's got going for me is 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 a great atmosphere superb locations and superb cinematography and 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 brilliant sound design as well i mean i, I yeah. watched it, i i think it's worth watching this on headphones and unless you've got a good sound uh, surround sound system mm. watch it with headphones because because when the guys when adam you know he, he's walking through the woods and he can hear noises off in the distance mm. and if you're wearing headphones you know you can really discern which direction the sounds are coming from you know, and it does sort of help build that atmosphere. I find. Um, yeah, I mean, because there's an awful lot of thought, like you say. I hadn't, I hadn't really, you know, thought to mention it, but there's a lot of thought put into that, into that kind of, into what's the stuff that's almost, almost not audible. Yeah. Um, right the way, through, not even just in the in those scenes in the woods, but right the way through, they they sort of little voices and things like that happening. Um, you know, that that are creepy to build the creepiness. You know, gradually, very gradually. Yeah. Um, I think the main difference between 
you know, again, this this is a film with lots of long takes, you know, sort of lots of silence as well, you know, because Adam's spending a lot of time in the zone. Even, even when his brother Pete turns up, I mean, Pete is, is, is stoic as hell, you know. I think he has about sort of five lines of dialogue in the whole film. Yeah. You know, it is, you know, it, it, not many people talk much in here apart from this one. <laughs> Um, and I think I think no, that's but, the main I mean, but Pete difference. Makes him, Pete, Pete makes Adam, you know, Pete, Pete, like Adam is almost practically silent. Yeah. I don't know what he, what I can't. I'm trying to remember what, what he's what he's actually said to anyone about anything in that film. Like no, he say, just thought lots of something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and Pete, Pete makes him look even quieter. And Pete hasn't yeah. even got that much to say. The, the person who talks the most <laughs> is the grandmother, and yeah. a lot of what she says doesn't help you understand or make sense of what's yeah. going on. Not at all, because you don't know how much of it is just in her head. Yeah, yeah. You know, because she's sort of suffering from uh, dementia, d- d- dementia so. basically, as well, you know, on, on top of everything. But I think I think what, you know, the main difference between this and Silence and Darkness, which is the one we, we just reviewed, is that um, it doesn't really draw you into the characters as much, uh, you know, mm-hmm. you, you're very much sort of on the outside of these people's heads, and you know, you know mm-hmm. you're, you're left to just observing their actions or, or lack of them. With uh, whereas with uh, the previous film, we've got these characters Anna, Anna and Beth. You know, you, you're much more engaged in, in what they're doing, and, and um, mm. uh, you know, sort of worried about them. Shall we say this one is like? I think. Uh, uh, sorry to cut you off. Go on. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say this one. You think you're looking at them going, you, you've got a clear choice here. You know, you, you've got a clear choice to sort of leave this stuff alone and just go, you know, but but no, you want to see it through. Um, whereas but you're not even sure what it is he's trying to see through. That's the thing, yeah, that's exactly. That's completely yeah, yeah. Puzzle me. Yeah. The, the, the reason why silence and darkness kind of reached out more, I mean, you had to give it time, but it reached out more and, and drew you in and <clears throat> made, you, made you be bothered about the girls is because <clears throat> even though most of their dialogue was silent and you weren't actually given it you don't know what they're saying when they're talking with their hands like with their contact sign language thing yeah um they are talking and you you are inferring a huge amount of, of who they are in their relationship by their responses and reactions they they are conversing and even if you don't understand it Pete and adam like it's, it's pretty much all one way in fact yeah adam's interactions with everyone in that film are one way you still have no idea you i think you needed a little bit more yeah, that he was able to give with his, you know, script. I think so. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, but other than that, you know, this this does have a lot going for it. But it is another sort of one that's going to test your patience. I think overall, um, yeah. it's it's got great visuals. It has you know great sound design. It looks mm. great. It's just that there's not a hell of a lot going on, and mm. you know. The, the characters are difficult to engage with. So I think on that basis, I'm giving this one a seven out of 10. Agreed. I mean, it, and it, it seems, it seems cool because it's not like anyone in that film wasn't trying, you know, they mm. were, they were convincing characters. It's just that there was just, I felt I needed more from, uh, more to understand what the hell Adam was actually doing out there. And the final quarter does seem to wrap it up a bit, you know, when the, the, the figures turn up in the, festivities really start to hmm. you know, kick off but yeah i'll go with that seven yeah there is there is one bit which, which again which just totally threw me there, there's there's one bit where he has a sort of dream sequence and i'm pretty fucking sure there's a ufo flying over yeah, the... yeah. <laughs> i thought i was like it was like do you remember that film uh, oh my god i think it was billy bob thornton a comb oh yeah yeah the um the uh, fire in there. the sky yeah no the, no the, the man who wasn't there i think it was oh the, yeah 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 and and like just randomly the ufo turns up over the prison <laughs> and then and then goes away again like then that's it and never gets referred to again yeah yeah, yeah. jesus like, christ yeah. That, that was i think it was I'm, I, yeah I'm, I'm glad i'm glad you spotted that because <laughs> Because I was like, I was imagining it. I thought I was imagining it yeah. as well. I thought, yeah, is that am I uh, am I not seeing happened? it clearly? Yeah, exactly. What the fuck's that meant to be? Yeah, bizarre. Anyway, so Sator gets uh, two sevens from me and Will. Our short shot this week is Quixotic Highway Violence. Uh, in this one, we have a group of women who are playing a video game, and then. The short takes us into the game and we get to see the live action version of it. 
So the, um, this is a, a really good pastiche of some um, 80s and 90s sort of tropes. Things like Terminator 2, uh, Back to the Future, Bill and Ted's uh, Excellent Adventure, that sort of thing, all done to this really cool uh, synth score done by uh, this band called Quixotic. Um, Rich, how did you find this? Yeah, uh, it's excellent. I, saw, I came across it from the, uh, I think it was Twitter or Facebook from the Maze Brothers who did uh, uh, Cyborg. Deadly oh, yeah. Machine. Yeah, there's uh, definitely, so they, yeah, yeah, you can see the sort of uh, similarities there. To, to yeah, it's, de it's definitely, you know, in their wheelhouse, it's the same kind of thing. It's also like Kung Fury, mm -hmm. you know, all, uh, all those things. It's actually, uh, there's no dialogue in this. It's a, um, essentially a music video, um, but it's got, you know, a full film sort of feel to it. They, you know, they open up with an Orion style logo, which also I think Maze yeah. Brothers also did. And then, you know, opening credits, Quite long closing credits the film itself so it's 11 minutes but the, the actual correct the end credits start at about five minutes yeah because it it, it, yeah. because there's so many there's so many people involved in in bringing the various parts of it to life into you know it's a visual effects uh, you know showcase you know yeah. the, as much as it is for the um uh, for quixotic who's a, a hungarian uh synth uh, synthesized music recording artist I've, um, I've looked them up on Spotify and I'm going to be falling asleep to their music later tonight. <laughs> um, so, so they do a great version of like the, um, the, the, the underground car park chase scene from um, Terminator 2 where mm -hmm. the, the guy sort of dresses the T-1000 sort of chasing yeah. the car. They, they, they do a really good version and the guy does a good impression of Robert Patrick even, even to the point where when he gets hit by bullets he does that sort of spinning out sort of thing, you know, sort of getting knocked back and then sort of continuing running. I, I, I thought that was really good. It was a really good pastiche. Yeah, it's uh, the, the, the whole, pr the project has been brought to life to, to play, say for this, the tune is called uh, Highway Violence. I think it comes from an album that he did a few years ago. So it's like a, a, something that's been gestating for quite some time. Mm. Uh, but it's, you know, it's as with them, with his music, he, you know, which is very 80s and that influence he's done one called Schwarzenegger, which has got some, which is all, you know, features like bits of the Terminator theme and mm. Arnie talking and stuff and other things that not uh, uh, video games like Outrun, which this film oh, also yeah. does. Mm. Um, it's, uh, say, it's a, it's that six minute or five or six minutes of that music and the, the, the story, like you say, is these girls are in an arcade setting you know what, what could be more 80s than that mm. and the visualization of of all these things just all these ideas being thrown at the screen so it starts off as one thing then it changes to so it starts off in a ferrari and then it goes into like um star wars back to the future yeah. so constantly changing to all these iconic mad cars max, and stuff. Yeah. there's a mad max scene there's in addition to that there's lots of other little references mm. to Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and there's a lot uh, there's a sign for Nakatobi Plaza on the on when they're oh, driving yeah, along yeah. So. also the, oh uh, Skynet <laughs> yeah Skynet at the beginning um there's also a nod to Stranger Things yes yeah and there's there was another one oh um was it was a Pine Hill the, a tree hill or something i can't remember what it's called now. Uh, hill valley from hill valley back to the future of course yeah, yeah yeah and there's also one of the great visual effects in the movie is when he pulls up at this uh diner which has mm. got all sorts of people outside of it but there's a millennium falcon <laughs> like taking off or landing just behind the diner it's br oh, brilliantly done mm. it looks it looks really great the, the tune is excellent uh, as as you might you know if you if you like synth wave stuff uh, uh, you know synth synthesized music you know it's it's definitely a must see and you know just count the references and stuff it's really good fun a bit different to what we normally do it's not a narrative film by any stretch of the imagination no it's uh, well worth seeing absolutely yeah um, so this is on YouTube we'll put the link to the um, to the short in the footnotes as we usually do so definitely definitely check this out it's a lot of fun it's six minutes um, you know unless you want to watch all the credits as well there, there is a sort of like tiny sort of after credits bit as well um, but yeah definitely worth checking out it's, and the music's great I have to say the music is, is superb Our DTV throwback this week is Warlock the Armageddon. 
An order of druids train their children to battle an evil warlock determined to unleash Satan upon the world by bringing a collection of five mystic runestones together. Um, now, Rich, I, I mentioned last week, um, you know, I'd seen the original Warlock film at the cinema. You know, it was my introduction to Richard E. Grant as an actor and mm. Julian Sands, of course. Um, but I'd never seen the sequels. Had you heard of it? Oh, yeah, of course I've heard of it. Oh, you, I, you, I, knew, I, you knew there were sequels. Yeah, I knew there were sequels. But um, the, the thing for me, the, the, the draw for the first one was Richard E. Grant. Right. So knowing he wasn't in the sequel put me off, I think, at the time, mm -hmm. you know. But um, what an idiot I was. What an idiot I was for, for not watching this back in the day, because this is a lot of fun indeed. Um, some of the visual effects do not stand up to the test of time, unfortunately. There are, there are some they are very dated at times. But uh, overall, Julian Sands is fucking brilliant in this. Um, and, and every time he's on screen, you know, this, this, this really works. Um, the story of the sort of the warlock, the, uh, the druids and their sons and daughters and things, um, not as good, I, I don't think. But um, yeah, it's, it's a very inventive story, you know, very, very inventive um, sort of kill scenes and that sort of thing going on. So, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. What's your memory of the first film? Could you, could you, would you be able to put it in context to, to, to so, fill me in on the backstory? So the first one, um, haven't you seen it? I, ha I, ha I have seen it once, right. many, many years ago, but it didn't make much of an impression. All right. So uh, Richard E. Grant plays this sort of witchfinder general kind of guy who captures Julian Sands' um, warlock. Um, but he sort of makes a pact with the sort of devil, shall we say, and, and is transported to the future. And, and Richard E. Grant gets sort of sucked through the wormhole with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then he's, I can't remember what he has to do. He has to sort of collect something, some, some bits and pieces. And uh, Richard E. Grant's character is helped by this young lady who... Was it Laurie Singer? Or... Laurie Singer, yeah. I was going to yeah. say Meg Ryan, but yeah, Laurie Singer um and, and it's yeah just it's really good Re really nasty at times as well you know some nasty ideas he kills a kid and then sort of melts his skin to be to make um, a flying potion you know uh, although you know it's all off screen but even so you know the idea that sort of you're, that, that's how bad your bad guy is but yeah I, I thoroughly enjoyed that film i remember seeing it a couple of times it sounds to, it sounds to me like the two films fit together better than i'd thought they did because for me, I always think of the first one as being like a fantasy movie mm. and this is like a full-on horror film uh, mm. with, with some fantasy elements but the it almost like you know a complete standalone it's not really none, nothing is referenced from the first film it's like he might not even be playing the same character it's mm. just he happens to look the same and they've used the title warlock um is is, is how it seemed to me uh, so it's interesting to he say about the yeah no he's, he, I got the impression that he you know, Julian Sands was playing the same character yeah you know he's got the because the I always thought I, my memory of the, the first one was that it wasn't set in the present that it was more of a um, a period kind of thing but I, from what you're saying it sounds a bit like they did a Highlander mm. thing of starting out yeah. in the old times and then maybe all of us sort of obviously with travel through portals or mm. whatever so that's quite interesting but this is more is this is am i fair to say that this is more of a horror film than the first one was or was the first one quite horror anyway there, there are some horror elements in the first one like um for example there was yeah he, he goes to see this medium um and sort of kill you know she, she gets possessed by this demon and then he says how you know how are you going to help me he goes use my eyes so you so i have to dig her eyes out <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's it has its little moments. Uh -huh. So, but, but I, this this I think this ups the ante for sure. Um, yeah. there's, there's a really classic bit in when um, one one of the druids inadvertently ends up in a lift with the guy, um, and then tries to take him out himself. And it just kind of, you know it cuts from like the you know him sort of trying to stab him to. The warlock sort of walking out of the lift 
and it's just like wall to wall blood and guts. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... I was I was going to highlight that as one of my favourite bits in the movie because yeah. there are some great set piece kills. It's basically the warlock. There's two stories unfolding. One is preparing mm. the youngsters mm. or the, the the youngster and his girlfriend for for the encounter that's going to come, and then the uh, the warlock's journey as he goes around collecting these rune stones. So it's like go to a place, kill someone in an interesting way, go to another place, kill someone. Yeah. So it's that slasher movie kind of thing. But uh, of all the kills, and, and there's some really, really good ones, uh, that, the, that, the understatedness of that scene and the way it was cut, mm. because the, some of the way the film is edited really bugged me, especially in the first half. It's like you got like a bit of a scene here and then it cuts away and you've got like two seconds of another bit and then it cuts mm. back and it, it feels a bit disjointed. But by the time you get to the end, the, the editing's really solid. Uh, and I love the way, you know, they, they don't, they, he like lifts the dagger and they, it's just a, a very quiet cutaway yeah. to, 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 to movie. I've, I'm sure I've seen that in other movies, but it's really well done. This is made by Anthony Hickox, yeah. who was on a hell of a run at the time, mm. uh, having started out with Waxwork and then done things like Sundown, Waxwork yeah. 2. Hellraiser 3, notably, was the one he, he did before this. Mm -hmm. uh, and you you can feel it. They're the same kind of there's the same kind of feel to, to yeah. the movie. I think uh, there's, a, there's a great cameo in this as well from Waxwork. Yeah, yeah. From um, was it Zach Zach Galligan? Is his name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I thought that was quite funny. But... Yeah, because this film's got that Terminator Terminator Two kind of mm. thing going on, and they do the kind of I want your clothes, <laughs> I want yeah. your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle kind of kind of scene. Uh, but you know, because Terminator Two was just I think it's just come out, so there's lots of little bits intentionally or not that are nodding to uh, terminator there's some there's even like a almost like a liquid metal kind of actually there's a couple um, there's a good melting effect at the end there's a well, melting yeah. effect at the end there's a bit where the uh, the warlock i think something he passes something through himself hmm. i think that's that's very much like something that was in t2 but the, um, oh yeah no you yeah, so he, he he gets impaled on a on a branch on a, hmm. and, and then he's able to sort of morph his way out of it yeah, the morphing, that's the word I was trying to think. And so morphing was being, that was quite the, the new big thing that mm. James Cameron had kind of set off for, well, with industrial light and mass shift and that, and they'd, they'd kind of set that free. So they, there's a lots of there's lots of visual effects in this movie. Uh, Star Wars, I'm, unusually, I didn't, I hadn't thought about it at the time, but watching it this time, I'm like, he's Luke Skywalker, that boy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's a whole China training thing, and it's like the, the orb on, the, uh, I don't know, what is it? Is it in the first film or the second film where he's got the orb kind of moving around him and oh, they've yeah, done it with a baseball yeah, in this film? Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, see that, 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 you know, unfortunately, that's the bit that really ages um, the film is the so, so the visual effects of the sort of floaty bits, you know, with it with the baseball and things like yeah. that, which is a bit too, a bit too silly. You know, there's more, there's better sort of practical effects going on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the practicals are great. I mean, no, the visual, when, it's, yeah. when it's the visual effects, the picture quality changes, doesn't it? You notice, so it's yeah. It you, gets you mentioned sort of weird. you mentioned Star Wars there. Mm. You know, so this is very much like Star Wars. Uh, I was wondering if it was a bit too much like Star Wars in that um, we've got these two characters, uh, Sam and the comment with the name of the girl. Um, who, I think I know where you're going with this. <laughs> because you know, it, it, it's sort of like hinted that um, both their mothers died in childbirth. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I was wondering if it was the same mother. Yeah, yeah, me you too. Because and, and, it's left hanging there, you know, because she's sort of saying, who am I, who am I, sort of thing. And so, well, your mother died at the same time as his mother. And it's like, hmm, could it be the same mother? Are you, are you related yeah. <laughs> in some way <laughs> that might be uncomfortable? <laughs> uncomfortable, considering where you end up later on. Um, but yeah no this is this is great fun i mean i i'm, I'm a big fan of julian sands as well i mean it, it's a pity that boxing helena happened really um but you know I, I think i think he's really good in these um the two warlock films for sure yeah he didn't he decided he wasn't going to turn up for the third they got bruce payne for that one mm. and uh and, and the... yeah they, they do sort of look a bit similar don't they the two they, they got a similar look in their eyes i think yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, they're, they're, they're both from around the same time. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, Bruce Payne was doing like um, Passage of 57. Passage of 57. Yeah. That was his big one. And they both turn up in kind of the same kind of movies even now. Mm. Uh, they sort of mix and match. Uh, you, you can sort of see them regularly. Um, what I thought, what I didn't think of, uh, I mean, I, because I haven't seen, 
I had this on video when it came out, so it was lovely to see it in widescreen this time. But mm. what I hadn't seen at that point was the films that would come after, which seemed to have clearly been influenced by it. Mm. And so this uh, Wishmaster in particular seems yeah. to owe a huge amount to this movie because Definitely. it's, the, it's yeah. the same idea of, you know, this villainous bargain, entity yeah. who's born. Uh, he, 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 he's born and then he finds someone, puts, you know, puts on this human... Uh, oh, that bit, yeah, suit. yeah, that's that's a really good bit. Well. He's walking around in a suit, being all charming, mm -hmm. and killing people in interesting ways, sort of twisting their words mm -hmm. and you know their demand desires. Say so what, what, what do you? I'm See that? Make you yeah, give this that, to that me. was an interesting bit as well. You know, the fact that he couldn't just take these rune stones. You know, they they had to be given willingly to him. Mm -hmm. So it's so all he, about manipulation. Yeah, which, which which gave it a really interesting sort of twist. So the well. the wishmaster. The first one that was several years later. I think from the same company that made this. Hmm. I might be wrong, but I think it, I think it was. Also, um, the prophecy which we covered. Uh, oh a yeah, few, Chris a, Walken a few and Co Coates, is yeah. very similar. You know, in type. So you've got Christopher Walken's character mm -hmm. turning these. I think in that case he's sort of reanimating people to sort of do his bidding. And be his like driver and stuff you know mm. the, the same right, thing yeah. happens in this movie which was uh, a year or two before um yep. and again the, the plotting and stuff and uh, i i asked uh matty bud revage dave wayne's mate ab mm -hmm. about him whether what he thought and he, he he mentioned something kim newman had said in one of his books saying that basically the the warlock um uh, warlock wishmaster and prophecy films are somewhat interchangeable hmm. so I, I feel sort of it, it's interesting i feel sort of validated in that sort of judgment that i came that 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 that, that there definitely seems to be some sort of trail that sort of takes us back to this fairly forgotten film yeah. that seems to have been quite influential overall i mean wishmaster interestingly was also basically a reworking of hellraiser 3 which was from the same director Mm. So he kind of took Hellraiser three and and Warlock and and made something new, maybe throwing in a bit of Leprechaun. Yeah. Stuff. But yeah, fantastic. Uh, the, the the kills in this are great. Say so really practical. I like the actors. The cast is brilliant. Paula Marshall mm. and her eyebrows made a hell of an impression <laughs> on me when I was a when I was a, when I was a boy. And she looked. She is still there. She still looks uh, great. And uh, she was in Hellraiser three as well. Uh, mm. Bruce Glover is in there as her father. The priest, yeah. So he's really good. We've also got the guy. I think it's, I think it's Charles 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 Hallahan. But um, the do you remember in the Lethal Weapon series the guy who's their captain? Oh yeah. So he's the dad mm. of of the boy in this. Who's played by Chris Young, who was in the John yeah. Candy movie The Great Outdoors, which I coincidentally now, watched recently. Am, am I am I wrong or not? Um, but wasn't one of the guys also see? Yeah, Charles Hallahan. See, you went for Lethal Weapon. I went The Thing with him. Oh, yes. Um, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Is, he, am I thinking of the right guy? Because there's yeah. two actors and they're quite... Uh, there's one of the other... Drew, the, the, basically, the guy who goes in the lift. Mm. He's another very familiar character actor and I wasn't sure if he was Hallahan. I, I, was, I, I don't know their names well enough to, to know which one's which, but they're both very uh, familiar yeah. character actors and which one was from... from the, yeah, The Thing, of course. Uh, it's again it's kind of yeah uh, i think you might be confusing them with somebody else yeah i, 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 I have to um he was in vision quest, so right? travis will uh will travis oh let me go and hang on oh so the father is played by steve kahan see i didn't i never even knew that name i've never even heard I'd, i've never even picked up on it but he's a really familiar character actor say yeah. um lethal weapon is the is the, is the films that I always think of him from because he's just so memorable in those, but he's also been in like Demolition Man and uh, what else? Uh, yeah, he, uh, a few, not as many films as you would expect. I think the last thing he's credited on is 16 Blocks. With, All right, um, with Bruce Willis. With Bruce Willis in uh, 2006. I, I mean, apart, uh, seems like the, the Lethal Weapon movies were probably the most significant thing he's... Uh, He's generally done, but yeah, he's re he's really good in this as the dad. I like the fact that the plot focuses on these older gentlemen and not mm. just on the kids, which are, you know, horror movie like this would normally be. He's the boy discovering his destiny or whatever and doing it on his own. In in this case, you know, his dad's right there all the time, guiding him through it. Yeah, uh, literally taking him 
to hell and back in in in, in one scene, and uh, his and the other druids, the other druid guys. So there's a there's a there's different facets. You've got the young love story. You've got the older guys who've got this burden of responsibility and trying to sort it out, uh, sort out this problem that they've been preparing for for hundreds of years. Mm. You know, passed down to them. And then you've got the the full on horror story of of the warlock and his and his. Um, and his having spring. fun, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's really, really, really good film. Really brief, you know, roughly well paced. It's only about ninety minutes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's uh, available on Amazon Prime. And as Richard mentioned earlier, it's in a nice widescreen print as well, which you know wasn't available on on VHS back in the day. So this is definitely worth checking out. Um, I, I, I thoroughly recommend the first one but you don't need to see it for this no, you know um, do, just no. a standalone film um definitely definitely check it out and that's the end of this week's show so thank you for will and rich for joining me to talk about these wonderful films uh you can find the trailers in the footnotes as well as quixotic's highway violence film uh, don't forget to check us out on Twitter and Facebook, where you'll find the DTV chart and news about new releases as well. Other than that, thank you for listening and tune in next time. Thank you for listening to the DTV Digest. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and tune in again next time. <laughs>